Hey everybody, in bed now because my phone charges a little bit better in here. Um, so we're going to read the black book now. This is the black book. Another poetry book I made about two years ago. And then I took a two year sabbatical from poetry to focus on my life and growing as a man and becoming a stronger person. So since then I've I've started writing poetry again about five weeks ago, and I've got about six books of poetry ready to go, um, but I figure we should start chronologically, so this is the black book. Um, there's two parts to this, I'm going to include them both in this video, and I'd like to mention before I start reading that I purposefully, in my other videos, I've purposefully used copyrightable music, uh, because I invite censorship. Um... I hope they try to censor me, um, because that only vindicates me as an artist. The more I'm censored, the more um, credibility I have as someone you should listen to, because they will go out of their way to censor uh, free thinkers. So I happily invite all forms of censorship, and uh, I kind of view that as a badge of honor. So, um, my name is Jackson Frederick Kelly. This is a book about my thoughts on the world, politics, and most importantly, people. I can remember feeling a deep paranoia since a very young age. I remember sleepless nights as a young eight or nine year old, staring at my window, waiting for the inev inevitable moment a group of black armor clad barbarians would kick through my basement window and steal my precious life and freedom. Let me set this camera up better. This thought passed through my skull for years, until my body and mind was so scarred with fear that I repressed the very concept away. Why was I so scared? Why did, why did this image of a SWAT team stealing me into the void even enter, enter a child's mind? This paranoia looms over me to this day, like a swarm of locusts, chewing and gnawing at every nerve in my body. I don't trust anybody. Well, I do now, but two years ago I didn't. Um... Not even friends. I'm just beginning to trust my girlfriend. After years of true love, partnership, dedication, sacrifice, and trial. I'm just now beginning to relax and allow myself to be comfortable. I see my paranoia as a true mental illness. That feeling is dwarfed by the weight of my self-destructiveness. I've had problems with constipation since I was seven. To this day, I consistently bleed when I shit. I was told at 17... If things didn't improve, I'd be shitting through a bag. The solution is one cup of water with Miralax a day. It always has been. Not hard. The solution has actually been quite easy to achieve. Um, fucking A. Stupid fucking phone. Okay. You know, plug it. Fuck it. If it dies, it dies. There we go. Much better. Um, the solution is one cup of water with Miralax a day. It always has been. I still don't do it. I'm almost always dehydrated. I'm never hungry. In high school, I was guard in football. Five foot eleven, ripped, technical, powerful. I was maybe 170 pounds. Now I'm 180, but my body is pathetic. Or it was pathetic. Yeah, I've gotten stronger since this. Um, running 30 feet left me winded. I almost passed out on a 100 meter dash. At this point, if you're even still reading, you probably hate me for this pity party. And you're right to. People see more trauma in a day than I'll see in my entire lifetime. But my mental illness serves a purpose in being known. These are all negative side effects. But I love my paranoia. I love my depression. They've been closer to me my entire life than any other person could even hope to be, and they serve a purpose. If I was happy, I wouldn't be writing right now. If I felt safe, I would shut my mouth. I don't feel happy, and I don't feel safe, and my body is the best thing I have to measure that by. Mental illness is only a sickness if you allow it to be. 
Humans are animals, and like all living things, we are built to survive. Your body would not do anything unless it was meant to help you keep going. My mental illness isn't a weakness. It's part of your body's natural mechanisms. So why is it there? Humans are predators. Not only that, they are the most successful predator this world has ever known since the dinosaurs. Humans are dangerous. But we didn't get to be the best by running the fastest or hitting the hardest. Tools helped a little, but it's not the bow or spear that led to humanity's success. We won by convincing our prey that we're their friends. Think of the relationship between a farmer and a chicken. The chicken loves the farmer. He feeds it, gives it shelter, houses it with other chickens, even fights off predators like coyotes and wolves. The farmer is the chicken's feeder, landlord, protector, and his predator. He's only doing any of this to abuse the chicken. He eats her eggs and plans to eat her. Humans have become so good at this that there's no longer any need to hunt. We have everything we need covered by our massive population of docile prey. So how does the predator fulfill his primal desire to hunt? A tiger will not eat meat he doesn't fight for. The world begins to make more sense when you see that the top of the heap on earth is dominated by predators. They keep us safe. They give us jobs. They clothe us. They feed us. We become too incompetent to do these things on our own. So we rely on our provider. Just like chickens. I want to apologize here. Um, our, I want to apologize ahead of time for the disgusting nature of this conversation. Um, I would also like to say, do not show children this conversation. This is a very, very heavy topic. Um, this conversation. I'd also like to apologize for giving you homework. The book Pimp by Iceberg Slim and 1984 by George Orwell are very important reads, and I will be making direct references to each throughout this conversation. In order to communicate my deep dissatisfaction with the system, we must explore the relationship between a pimp and a whore. A whore is not somebody who sells her body for money. That's an important disti distinction. A whore is not a woman who sells her body for money. A whore is somebody who sells their body for money, then gives 100% of the profits to a pimp. A pimp is a man who's convinced her they're in love, almost like they're married, but on the understanding that he will give her a, all the luxuries of life in exchange for 100% of the profit while well, simply having to pay for her housing, clothing, and exquisite personal tastes. He's a con man. He's getting rich for sitting on his ass while women fuck strangers for him. He's a leech, a greedy, life-killing bloodsucker. He manages this lie by presenting himself like a god amongst men. He is the most intelligent, sexiest, baddest man alive. Or at least a ticket to a life of luxury. She is bound by his list of rules at threat of beating, and in the hands of a gorilla pimp, is bound to stay at threat of death. Of course, in the world of Iceberg Slim, a gorilla pimp is a chump. In 1930s Chicago, pimps were everywhere, as it was really the only ticket to a wealthy lifestyle for a black man outside of robbing banks and selling drugs. To pimp by brute force would be an insult to the art to somebody like Iceberg. To quote one of his pimp buddies, a pimp cops a whore. He cons her, maybe if she stays in his corner, humping his pockets fat. At the end of the rainbow, she's got a husband and a soft, easy chair. To hold her beak to the grindstone, he pumps air castles into her skull. She takes all the stable grief, or all of the grief from the other prostitutes. Um... She humps her ass into a cramp to outshine the other whores in the family. As she gets older and uglier, her competition gets younger and prettier. She don't have to be no big brain to wake up there ain't no easy chair at the end of the rainbow. A good pimp is a master manipulator, a parasitic predator, whose charm, luxury, ex extravagance, and brilliance makes the whore forget that he does everything for himself. Any good pimp is his own best company. This is another quote. His inner life is so rich with cunning and scheming to outthink his whores. End quote. 
Whether you like it or not, America is a pimp nation. Every aspect of our system is designed to make the regular man desperate, weak, undignified, and reliant on his masters. Let's reread the same quote with a few adjustments. A boss hires an employee. He cons him that maybe if he stays in his corner, working his pockets fat, at the end of the road he's got a good savings and a soft, easy retirement. To hold his beak to the grindstone, he pumps air castles into his skull. He handles the grievan the worker handles the grievances of every other coworker. He busts his ass to exhaustion to outshine his competing coworkers. As he gets older and slower, his competition gets younger and faster. If only he was able to realize big savings and retirement belong to a select few. The rest of us live paycheck to paycheck and are more likely in debt than on the rise. Even if we manage a meager savings, regular economic collapses leave the working man footing the bill and the pimps running away with an even bigger chunk of change than they had before the collapse. This part of the book is hard to write because I'm so angry I want to fit a pantheon of insults into this one page. Fuck these rich motherfuckers. These un-American traitorous fucks. We provided them with the foundation of the greatest economy this world has ever seen, and how is this repaid? How do they show their appreciation to the country that gave them a platform to succeed to begin with? They steal from us, they lie to our faces, and they extort us. I need to explain something. There has always been this, this dynamic since the beginning of mankind. There has always been the best hunter, whose fruit bared so much good for the tribe that he held leverage over each and, other, ev each and every one of our heads. Eventually, though, we learned to hunt better as a group. <clears throat> this exceptional man held less and less leverage, saw other hunters with success, and knew this was unacceptable for his position of dominance. He then evolved into what I call a resource hoarder. If he can't control the meat, he'll control the rocks that make arrowheads. If he can't control the rocks, he'll take control of the water supply. Whatever he took, he learned to love taking. And then you have a family of pimps. And that is what runs the world today. Is not one pimp and his stable, but a conglomerate of pimps working together. Um, the family of mobs and corporations. Corporations function like a mirror. Whatever shape your product takes, they will imitate. So this is a little graph of how that works. So let's say this is you. You just came up with product A. Well, Walmart and Target and all of these big corporations are going to replicate that and um, create a copy. You make product B, they copy it. You make product C, they copy it. You make product D, they copy it. With connections over the entire world, they will grow and outcompete your product by outpacing and outdistributing your product. This tactic is so successful that corporations have a market monopoly on basic goods completely. This includes literally every possible good and service that humans can produce. Um, and that is the end of my black book. That's where I got scared and didn't feel comfortable writing anymore. So I've, um, I've got one other poem at the end of the book. Um, I've got a picture right there. And another picture that I drew um, right here. And I'll explain the significance of these pictures um, throughout the poem. This is the writings I had. Um, I wrote all of this on acid. So I've taken um, LSD one time. I had a very bad trip. Um, I actually saw demons everywhere around me. Um, and I decided to write about it. So this is a poem from my acid trip. Um, the only time in my life I've felt true prey-like fear. Um, true fear. We need this. Bring fear back. We're starved of it. We're devoid of it. Evil has no fear. Good is losing. This is the hardest rant of my life. 
you must follow me to the other side to understand I'm not a genius. I'm a retard on a slip on on one sip of a genius's glass of champagne. I am better than them. So are you. I believe in us. My strength alone isn't enough. The side of human thought too scary to face. We must face fear. I'm not crazy. Crazies are created to create a delusion that the world is one of complete good. The wall we can't talk about. <clears throat> Why isn't my opinion allowed on TV? I know I'm right, but we're all too scared to talk, right? Why are we afraid of what I'm saying? Why is it so scary and so not allowed? I can't face this alone. I fear not being a public figure. I fear being all alone. Everything is a hypnosis, an illusion. The masters knew this game long ago, but now I'm playing. I'm a new force. I need you all to listen to me. I genuinely don't trust a single human being other than my dear Melinda. I'm in the world where demons roam. It's right here around me. People demand a voice because we're scared. For the future, for God's sake, what's wrong with the world? I reduce to dust. Does that mean anything to anybody? I feel awake, awashed in reality. Life looks at us all one of two ways. You're either a listener or a doer. I lie in the land of the sleep folk. The land of us who are too afraid to stand up for ourselves. Those who lay terrified of the world around us as a horrible, demented wasteland of <laughs> lunatics and psychopaths. I need someone to tell me I'm not crazy. Melinda, am I crazy or not? Do people hate me? Am I a monster to them? This is no way for anybody to exist. Not me, not anybody else. We need to stand the fuck up for ourselves already. The bloody horror of what I see around me scares me to my core. I've been persecuted. My kind. The lover. The carer. I give a shit about you. Doesn't the ability to communicate? At least I have that. Don't you see how you're all so willing to throw me away? My girl thinks I am. So do I. This is just one of many bad ways to go. I can't get lost. I must stay connected. I'm not crazy. Don't throw me away. Stop crushing me, world. I am but nothing. I am man, too. I must fight my regression into a lesser being. I must remain connected to reality, and I need validation. A fucking hell. I feel so severely underrepresented. I feel severely alone in this world. And those with hate in their hearts want me to feel this way. Want me afraid. Too afraid to speak. I need to conquer my fear. Show me yourselves. Do we have the strength to conquer our demons or not? Mine, our insecurity of self. I have to bridge a connection back. I feel the mind of a man going insane. This country is literally driving me insane as a human being. I'm suffering beyond comprehension. I'm living in hell. I see it around me. This whole world looks like a big hell. Don't push me aside. I want a seat at the table of those people we listen to. I want to be listened to by everyone right now. I'll never be this awashed in fear again. Huzzah. I fight. I fight another day. I have to trust that everyone around me wants something to, wants something to change.
way worse than I expected. I see the very lowest in people. I fear all people. Even now it feels like I'm breaking from a hypnosis. I've been scared of this feeling my whole life. Fear, fear, fear. I'm still sane. P please listen to me. I haven't lost it. Don't send me away, please. I don't want to go. I love this species. I love this planet. Don't let me go. I'm awash in the animal world. I feel the fear of a hunted moose. Of the type of being once ex extinct resurfacing. I feel like a tiny cricket on a lake. The fear I feel is connected to that demon. Everything in my instinct. My basic human instinct. I've indulged myself in the real world for you. Now I'm back. It's just me. I need a path back to truth and reality. I need to step back into my own life. This fucked me up. I feel like I'm losing my grip to reality. I like being in this place. It's my feebleness and fear that cloud my mind. I need to stand up to the world around me and take control. I feel like I'm breaking from a hypnosis. I feel like these could be my last moments on earth. Even basic stuff, I'm losing here. I feel like I'm regressing as a person. I need to grow. I need, I need help right now. It's the demon. I will draw him. I need to feel like everything is okay. I feel like it isn't. I looked back into the eyes of the demon just then. He made me feel depressed and all alone. It does in every moment. I feel like I'm looking a demon in the, in the face. I'm seeing evil in its purest form. I'm terrified. Petrified on the back of my chair. <clears throat> Everything feels hot. But I'm coming back. They are only the eyes of a demon, not a god. I can control him. He is in my mind. I will draw him on the opposite page. The feeling of beginning of something. To realize that you have time. Life hasn't caught up to you. Everything is still okay. It's what we all need to hear, deep down. And these are my attempts at drawing the demon. I saw him in the fence while I was on acid. Um, that's uh, the most basic. Um, here's another little one. Um, that's just of his eye. Um, and this is a more complete picture right here. Um, obviously it's not perfect. If I could get a picture of him, that would be ideal. Um, I can still see him in the fence. It's literally just a piece of wood that looks like a demon, but, um, on acid, I literally felt the power of it. And, um, that's how it made me feel. And those were the thoughts going through, through my head while I was on that acid trip. Um, so since then I've completely conquered my fear. I now live fearlessly every day. I still live as if I'm going to die tomorrow because I don't feel safe in the world and I don't believe I'm safe in the world. Um, I do believe that at any time my life could be taken from me. And um, it's conquering that fear that allows me to make these videos and speak directly to you. So um, there's my black book. And more poetry to come. And I'm going to be recording my first rap album probably tomorrow or the next day or sometime this week, um, which is going to be very exciting. It's a very, very exciting album. It's, I would consider it the best rap album ever made, but that's still to be determined. That's for you to decide, not me. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoyed and I hope you feel I've provided something of value with my thoughts and my opinions. So, uh, thanks for listening, uh, signing off for now.